Thanks, Kirsty, for that introduction, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And I want to start by saying uh, a word of thanks to ICAS. Um, Anton, you and your team do an amazing job. Um, you're a powerful voice for your profession, not just uh, in this country, but with almost half of your membership outside Scotland, uh, also in the UK and overseas too. And I also think that ICAS has fulfilled in this debate another very important function, because you have put yourselves at the forefront uh, of this debate and your expertise in financial issues and tax issues has shed light on some of the key issues, some of the key uncertainties that Scotland would face uh, as a separate state. Your work on tax administration, uh, for example, or on pensions provision has been hugely relevant and uh, insightful. And so I also commend you for the very important public service that you have been providing in this debate. And of course, today's conference is part of that. Uh, aptly titled Scotland's Future, and it's, that is precisely, of course, what each and every one of us will be voting on come the 18th of September, because this is the most important vote that will take place in our lifetimes. It's arguably the most important vote in the history of the United Kingdom. And the approach of the UK government has always been absolute respect for our right as the people of Scotland to make our own choice, while also providing all the relevant information needed to support people in making this hugely important decision. People do want to know what the, break, what the benefits of being part of the UK are and what the risks of breaking up are too. I believe that open, transparent and credible governments should always give people access to the full facts. So, Kirsty, you could call our approach Project Fact. Um, because over the past year and a half, We've published a series of 14 analytical papers, one and a half thousand pages of original analysis, with cross-references cross to hundreds of academic articles and publications. They represent the most far-reaching and comprehensive study of the relationship between Scotland and the UK that has ever been undertaken. We've looked at every aspect of the deep, multi-layered relationship which binds our countries together from economics and banking to security and defence to name just a few topics. In every one of our studies, we've looked at how Scotland and the UK benefit one another. We've always based our analysis on the best available data, utilising expert legal and technical knowledge, while also always encouraging full external scrutiny of our findings. It's been a hugely ambitious analytical programme. I'm sure everyone in this room has digested every page of it. Um, but in case you haven't, Today I'm publishing the final conclusions of that programme, this document, United Kingdom, United Future, Conclusions of the Scotland Analysis Programme. And there are lots of copies available if you would like to take one with you or uh, to get one sent to you or whatever. And I'm sure that we can furnish that through ICAST too. Now, of course, I would encourage all of you to read every one of our reports, but if you've only got time to read one, make it this one. Um, it contains a, a wealth of information I believe all the arguments and all of the facts and quotes from many people, from presidents to business leaders, to help us make that important decision in September. I think the conclusions are clear and incontrovertible. Scotland is stronger, more prosperous, more successful, more influential as part of the United Kingdom. Nationalism would put at risk so much of what makes our country great. So today I'd like to use my time speaking here before taking questions to set out five key arguments in favour of Scotland staying in the UK. First as ever is the economy. As you know only too well, the Scottish and UK economies are recovering strongly. In the past year, the UK has grown faster than any other major industrialised economy. Faster than the US, faster than Germany, than Canada, Japan, France or Italy. What's more, the recovery is balanced across sectors with manufacturing services and construction industries all growing at a good pace. Now, we've had to take, we've all had to take some tough decisions so that as a country we can live within our means. But that long-term economic plan is working. Scotland's economic plan does not have to wait until after the referendum. It's already working here and it's working now. The deficit halved this year, new jobs being created at the fastest rate since records began. Over the coming year, the UK is expected to grow faster than any other G7 nation. Britain is bouncing back and Scotland is bouncing back too, and so why would anyone want to put the brakes on that? 
because our analysis, backed by a wide body of academic research, shows that if you put up an international border between Scotland and the UK, growth would be hit hard. That economic recovery, which we've all worked so hard to secure, would be stopped in its tracks. And it's easy to see why. By staying together, the Scottish economy can remain fully integrated with the rest of the United Kingdom. 70% of Scotland's trade is with England, Wales and Northern Ireland. That's right, Scotland trades more with the rest of the UK than with every other country in the world combined. More than 16,000 people commute from Scotland to other parts of the UK every single day. But as a separate state, it will be harder to do business. Over time, laws, regulations, tax regimes will start to differ. Workers wouldn't be able to move quite so freely. The ability to trade with one another would be eroded. What's more, by staying together, our economies can support more jobs. Thanks to your efforts in companies and firms of all sizes, the private sector has created over 2 million jobs across the UK since 2010. In Scotland alone, employment has increased by 140,000 since then and has reached an all-time high of 2.6 million Scots in work. And many hundreds of thousands of those jobs are in Scotland's key sectors, like energy, defence, financial and professional services. All these sectors thrive and only can thrive because we are part of the United Kingdom. Here in Edinburgh, for example, we have a financial and professional services sector which benefits from common regulations and strong links to markets backed by a state with deep pockets and a strong currency. A low-carbon industry that benefits from a UK-wide approach to renewable energy with costs supported by 30 million consumers across our four nations. Oil and gas around Aberdeen benefiting from a larger UK tax base which provides stability and predictability. A defence industry where the UK government is the main customer for shipbuilding and technology. In all of those key sectors, the UK provides a larger customer base with greater purchasing power within a more stable economy. And my second argument is about our currency. As part of the UK, Scotland uses the pound, one of the world's oldest, strongest and most stable currencies. So we can keep that, a currency backed by 31 million taxpayers and backed by the Bank of England. Or we could vote for the unknown, because the nationalists still don't have a workable plan for the currency. A currency union with the rest of the UK is out of the question. The Governor of the Bank of England and many others have explained in careful detail just how difficult it is to run a successful currency union. And we've seen in the euro area, it simply would not work without a full political, economic and fiscal union, which of course is precisely what the nationalists want to dissolve. Even if Scotland tried to use the pound without formal agreement, an arrangement known as sterlingisation, a, a Scottish version of Panama's currency arrangements, it would mean Scotland would not have a central bank to set interest rates or protect financial institutions and pension providers from market instability. So on the currency, a vote for independence would open up the floodgates to a sea of financial, economic and market uncertainty. And so I think the nationalist approach to this issue is not only hugely irresponsible, it's also deeply inconsistent. For a party which so firmly believes in independence, it seems odd to want to give up control of the most fundamental aspect of economic policy. The third of my five arguments is about public services. Because by staying together, Scotland's national finances will be much stronger. Because as a bigger economy, bigger country, we can pool resources and share risks. It means, for example, that we can more easily deal with unexpected shocks to our tax revenues. For example, we can deal with what everyone, or well, everyone, I think, apart from some of the nationalists, knows is the steady and inevitable decline in North Sea oil and gas revenues. It means we can use government spending to fund public services according to need, not to location. For example, we can do more to support Scotland's more rapidly ageing population. So we're not actually ageing more rapidly. Um, uh, but the demographic structure of our population is different. Certainly not ageing more rapidly in this conference. And crucially, as a bigger economy, we can borrow more cheaply in the financial markets. Altogether, the long-term benefit of staying in the UK is worth £1,400 per person 
each and every year. It's the UK dividend. It's the money that will pay for better public services and a fairer society. To put it in context, it's equivalent to around two-thirds of the total National Health Service budget in Scotland, almost as much as Scotland's whole education budget. To offset the loss of that dividend without cutting public spending, a new Scottish state would have to increase the basic rate of income tax from 20 to 28 per cent, VAT from 20 to 26 per cent, and increase duties on alcohol, tobacco and fuel by about 40 per cent. Now I know that we've seen recently that the uh, SNP want to go on a further borrowing spree to fund higher public spending. Under their plans, therefore, it now seems that Scotland would have one of the worst budget deficits in the developed world. So let's not go there. By staying together, Scotland can have stronger finances and a more progressive society. The fourth argument is about Scotland's voice in the world. As part of the UK, we are part of an influential country that has a seat at the top table. We're a permanent member of the UN Security Council, a member of the G7, the G8, the G20, right at the heart of NATO. As one of the big four members of the EU, we're involved in all the key decisions. We can use our collective power and influence to make the world a better place. As the second largest aid donor in the entire world, something I'm very proud of that we have reached in this government, through disaster relief, work during humanitarian crises, and as part of peacekeeping missions. We can also use our global reach to support British people and British businesses through our overseas network of embassies and trade promotion agencies. The contrast, of course, under independence is, is huge. Not a permanent seat at the UN, not a part of the G7 or the G8, having to apply to join the European Union. That would mean negotiating terms with all 28 EU countries. And I can tell you one thing for sure, it would be a very complex and lengthy process. And think of the impact that that uncertainty would have on your work and on your businesses. And you can be sure that if and when that, that negotiation is eventually completed, that it would not be on the same favorable terms that the UK currently enjoys. Thanks to our EU budget rebate, for example, worth three billion pounds a year, as well as opt-outs to keep our own currency, control of our borders, immigration policy, etc. Hardly the most auspicious way to set up a new Scottish state as a new country finding its way in a turbulent global economy. Instead of that, we can retain the loud and persuasive voice that the UK rightly commands across the world. My final point is that if we were to vote to go it alone, there's no going back. Scotland, by definition, would leave the United Kingdom and become a new separate state. Separation would be permanent, and it would have profound implications for life in Scotland and life in the rest of the United Kingdom. Think of the great institutions that are part of our national life, the Met Office, the National Lottery, the Post Office, the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force, the BBC. More than 200 UK public institutions serve the Scottish people. And if we vote to leave the UK, we vote to leave those current arrangements behind. To me, this illustrates just how irreversible our decision really is. And this can, of course, be avoided by voting to stay as part of the United Kingdom. And I think the UK gives Scotland the best of both worlds, the security and stability of being part of a larger entity with a strong Scottish Parliament too, meaning we can find Scottish solutions to Scottish issues while remaining a, a part of a stronger United Kingdom. And of course, this week, all three main parties, main opposition parties in the Scottish parliamentary context Liberal Democrats, Labour and Conservatives, committed to going even further to enhancing Scotland's devolution settlement. A new settlement which would mean significant new power to raise taxes, bringing accountability and greater financial responsibility at Holyrood. So where does all of that leave us? In my view, a stronger economy, a safer currency, better public services, a stronger voice and the best of both worlds. Five arguments, each one based on logic and on reason. Now, I'm a Treasury Minister. You're all in business and finance. We like logic and reason. But this is about much more than that. It's about our place in the greatest family of nations that the world has ever seen. It's a history which has seen British ingenuity and endeavour emerge triumphant time after time. And over centuries, our four nations have worked together to change the world. Because of that, we can face the future with confidence and optimism. Now, I am as proud and patriotic a Scot as any nationalist. 
I love Scotland and because of that, I want the best future for all of us in Scotland. And to me, that means a united kingdom with a united future. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much uh, to Danny Alexander. Uh, we'll be taking questions on the floor. The mics are coming down, so uh, we're ready to take questions. Can I just um, take you back to what you said about the economy? Mm. You categorically said the economic recovery, if it was independence, the economic recovery would be stopped in its tracks. How can you say that categorically? For the reasons I... For, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, for the reasons I set out in my uh, remarks, that um, if you look at uh, the impact on trade that is set out in this uh, analysis of independence, if you look at uh, the most important sectors of the Scottish economy, financial services, oil and gas, renewable energy, business and professional services, all sectors that, um, that, have, that have grown up because of our ingenuity as, as Scots because of our frameworks, but also because we are part of the United Kingdom. And if you look at all the evidence in here, you see um, that, for example, let's take financial services as, as an example. Um, one of the reasons why we have such a strong and successful financial services sector here in Scotland, I believe, is because we have a common single regulatory framework, something that you can't continue as an independent state. EU law requires separate regulation, different tax system, and so on to be uh, to be set up. Uh, you could look at renewable energy. I mentioned that in my remarks, where the huge innovations and success we've seen of renewables in Scotland is off the back of subsidies that are paid for and spread across 31 million households across the uh, United Kingdom. I could go on across, you know, go on at too much length. Uh, each of those areas would be set back, and that's why our economic recovery would be set back too. I don't, think I don't actually think on, 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 on those things, people involved in those industries have any I have any doubt about those about those claims. It's a, it's a huge amount of disruption uh, in a small economy to happen all at one time. And I think that would absolutely set our recovery right back on its heels. So just to go back, um, we knew obviously um, after the election that a referendum was coming. You know, now that um, the referendum campaign is underway, the, the, um, the parties that are supporting the status quo have been falling over themselves uh, to offer new powers and so forth. Well, where were they before the possibility of a referendum? I mean, this is the interesting thing, isn't it? It's only when the gun is to the head of the coalition, in one way, you start ponying up. Well, I reject that, not least as a member of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. I'm a member of a party that has wanted Scotland to have home rule within a federal United Kingdom since 1885. Um, uh, I think Mr. Gladstone first set out the plans for home rule all round. Uh, our most recent commission under Ming Campbell, um, was, that work was completed several years ago. Um, we have just actually delivered uh, in the 2012 Scotland Act the single largest piece of financial devolution has ever happened within the United Kingdom since 1707. Uh, I think it's, it's a failure on our part in a sense. I think a lot of people still don't know that uh, in about 18 months' time, every single person in this room, every single person in this country will be paying a Scottish rate of income tax, which will go to support the work of the uh, Scottish Parliament. As of next year, we'll have a new system of property taxation in this country. You, know, you won't pay stamp duty anymore. You'll pay a new uh, Scottish version of stamp duty that's established by the Scottish Parliament because uh, in the last uh, you know, few years, the Calman Commission brought everyone together to work out what the next steps in devolution were. That has been implemented in legislation. Um, that is a huge set of changes. Um, I've always believed um, and my party has always believed that that process has got a lot further to go. Uh, I'm delighted that, um, uh, that both Labour and Conservative parties have set out their own plans um, for, 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 for doing that. To me, that is achieving uh, the right objective for Scotland, which is a Scottish Parliament that is financially accountable and financially responsible, as well as spending money also responsible for raising it and for explaining to people who pay taxes um, you know, w w what that money is being uh, is being used for. That seems to me to be the right place to, to, to get to. By the way, if I can, sorry, it's a long answer to what was a very simple question. If I can add one other thing to it, uh, I would also like to see a, a, a reversal of this really quite damaging trend towards centralization within Scotland that we've seen over the last uh, seven years. As a, as, a, as a Highlander, as an MP from the Highlands, you know, we've seen uh, an awful lot of power taken from institutions that were more localized 
and brought up to Edinburgh and to Holyrood. You know, the centralisation of our policing, of our, uh, of our fire services. Are Hang all... on, so you're not for uh, Police Scotland then? No, absolutely not, never have been. Um, I don't think it will save any money, and I think it means um, less relevant, less locally accountable uh, policing. Um, I, that's one of the reasons why I've spoken out so strongly against this issue about armed police officers being deployed uh, all over Scotland. Certainly in the Highlands, it's, 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 it's affected people very deeply because it, it is a big step away from... I know this is maybe beyond the scope of this conference, but I think that devolution isn't just about Edinburgh. It's actually about the communities uh, and, and the, the people in the regions of Scotland. And certainly as a Highlander, I would like to see a much more, much more um, accountability and responsibility held in the Highlands and Islands. So I think we shouldn't just, in this debate about more powers, focus on what happens here in Edinburgh. We need to focus on what the whole of Scotland is like. I want to take a question from over here in a second, but just um, on the question of North Sea Oil, uh, um, Jim McCall, you weren't here for Jim McCall's speech. I'm he sorry, said that there's it. more value to be taken in terms of what's to come out of the North Sea still than to what's come out of the North Sea in the past. So why would it be so tough for Scotland economically to rely to some extent on North Sea oil? Um, there is a huge amount of, of, um, of oil and gas that remains to be extracted from the North Sea. I completely agree about that. Um, and that's why, in fact, uh, my government has put in place decommissioning relief for North Sea oil for the first time, which is precisely to give some financial certainty to those companies who are investing. It's why we set up the Wood Review and the new Oil and Gas Authority, which is being implemented now, again, precisely to enable that to happen. I think the issue is uh, not about whether we want or not to maximise economic recovery from the UK continental shelf. I completely agree about that. I think what we have to understand, though, is the extent to which that is going to be something which yields the sorts of tax revenues we've seen in the past. Because the truth is, I think, and certainly my extensive discussions with people in that sector uh, lead me to this conclusion, that the places that we're now going to find the remaining reserves are more ex expensive to get to, more investment intensive. You're looking at, um, for example, these high pressure, high temperature uh, fields that are you know, deep, deep under the, the ocean floor, which are relying on remarkable newly developed technology to get to. And in fact, we've, offered, we've had to offer very substantial new tax breaks to the industry to get to those reserves. And so I think increasingly there's a trade-off for us between maximising the economic benefit of North Sea oil and its tax benefit. And I think the truth is that we're going to have to sacrifice a lot of that tax benefit over the years to come if we really want to incentivise the investment. And why that matters in this, in this debate about independence is because, um, yeah, we all want to get, that, get the, the, those oil and gas resources out of the, uh, out of the ground, out of the sea, whatever. Uh, it's not a cost-free exercise. And the nationalist predictions are all based on heroic assumptions about rising oil revenues in future. Um, uh, in fact, their, their own most recent publications give oil revenue figures even for 2016-17, which are twice, more than twice, the uh, independent forecast of the Office for Budget Responsibility. And so if you want to, um, uh, uh, if you want to get, if you want to get more oil and gas out, actually in each and every year, we're going to have to access, accept a bit less tax revenue. It may go on for longer. Uh, and that means that the public finances of an independent Scotland would be much weaker, whereas the deeper financial pockets of the United Kingdom enable us to absorb those sorts of hits precisely to enable the economic recovery of the, of, of the North Sea. Question here. Yes, uh, David Brown, AG Taggart. Um, you, you, again, referring to the uh, deep pockets of the United Kingdom, but um, the United Kingdom has a 1.3 trillion debt and uh, a GDP to, to debt ratio that's been compared with the Weimar Republic. In earlier this I year... I haven't heard that comparison myself, but um, well, I have now, obviously. <laughs> earlier this year, the, the UK um, government sought to reassure financial markets by uh, uh, confirming that the, that the UK would be the continuing state and would um, re uh, remain liable for all the UK debt, whether Scotland becomes independent or not. Um, in, in that case, is there any reason why an independent Scotland should take on any uh, voluntary um, assistance with that if uh, the UK government is not prepared to play ball with assets and currency? Uh, yes, there is a very good reason, but let me just go back to some of the points that, that sort of preamble, because I think they're also important to the answer to that uh, question. And you're right. Um, uh, the, the, you know, one of the, the sort of, if you like, almost the raison d'etre that brought the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives together in the coalition government was precisely to tackle these huge financial problems. By the way, 
financial problems that were caused by the financial crisis and the response to it, one of the things that we were able to do with those uh, deep pockets was make sure that two huge financial institutions, which affect not just the UK but the world economy, but are based here in Scotland, were able to be bailed out, something which would be way beyond the wherewithal of an independent Scottish state. So that's one relevant point in terms of deep in terms of, uh, of, of, of deep pockets. But in a sense, our raison d'etre has been to deal with those financial problems, uh, to, to get our deficit down. It's halved this year. Um, uh, and then you're right, to get our debt falling as a, as a share of our uh, economy. That's why the growth strategy, which we're now seeing the, 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 the fruits of, has been, has been such an important part of the, of the economic plan. Um, I think the reason why um, uh, it would be important for an independent Scotland not to run away from what I think everyone regards as, as taking a fair share uh, of, the, of the debts of the United Kingdom is, uh, and that's actually something that's been, that's been, I think, accepted by some of the more responsible nationalist politicians, um, uh, is the impact on, it would have on Scotland's financial reputation uh, as, a, as a new state that would be looking to borrow money on the world markets. I think there's a widespread consensus in the financial sector and the academic sector, including from the uh, recent report from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, that, that uh, uh, even if ever, everything was handled in, a, in, uh, in the most simple uh, and responsible way possible, uh, that Scotland would pay a premium on its, on its debt issuance uh, as a country uh, over gilts of between 1% and 2%. Um, uh, one bank, Jefferies Investment Bank, has looked at uh, the question of, um, uh, in the event of Scotland not taking its share of its debt and not meeting uh, uh, those repayments, what would the consequences be? Uh, and they estimate, I haven't, I haven't done this research myself, but they, but they looked at it and said um, that in the event of that sort of activity, you, you, would, you would end up with a premium perhaps more like 500 basis points over gilts. Uh, the cost implications of that, the reputational consequences of that for a, for a, for a for a new state which was seeking to establish for the first time uh, a reputation in terms of uh, financial stability and debt issuance, I think would be quite catastrophic. Um, Gordon Brown. So, sorry, uh, could, I, could I just come back on that? that um, sure. If, if we were not taking on the, the, the debt, we're not, we aren't, wouldn't be need, needing to borrow. So, I mean, I, I don't think that, uh, that uh, answer stands up. I, I'm afraid that isn't right. Um, uh, again, you can look at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, you can look at a whole range of independent bodies that are, that are listed in this report if you want to look at them. Um, Scotland's starting deficit is estimated to be in 2016-17, because of some of the issues I mentioned in my speech, uh, about twice that of the United Kingdom. So, uh, so about a 5.5% uh, deficit as a share of GDP. A deficit, by definition, is money you need to borrow that year in order just to fund your regular spending. Um, the, the things that I've said about uh, about oil revenues, about an aging population, would mean, you know, it, uh, it, for for an independent Scotland, that gap would be would be getting wider and more difficult to deal with. So, literally from day one, you would be having to borrow money just to fund the existing level of provision, let alone some of the um, expensive promises that are being made in in the in the white paper, which again would require yet more borrowing. I heard John Swinney, or, I'm sorry, I didn't hear him. I read an interview with him in the Herald uh, earlier this week, where in addition to all of that. Uh, he was suggesting that an independent Scotland would seek to borrow an additional 3% each year of public spending over and above the borrowing requirements just to fund the current position. So you're looking at a pretty huge deficit that has to be financed. Uh, and if you end up in a position where your debt interest costs are, uh, are much higher, then of course, as, as you would all know from your, from your business lives, the, uh, the debt dynamics of that rapidly become very difficult to sustain. Uh, just quickly on uh, Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown, who has entered the fray, uh, was scathing about the use of Lego figures by the UK government's cabinet office and treasury to illustrate the claim that Scottish voters would be £1,400 a year better off by rejecting independence with patronising references to fish and chips, suppers and bus rides. Presumably that was none of your doing. Well, uh, Gordon Brown's remarks were certainly none of my doing. <laughs> there are some things I can be held accountable for, but not what Gordon Brown has to say. Um, uh, Look, I think there was a, 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 I think, I think, I think there was an attempt which misfired somewhat to um, uh, to try and put the put the argument in a humorous way for a particular audience in social media. I, I think, frankly, that um, that having a having a debate that is is sort of po faced in the extreme is 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 is, is not great. So whilst it may have backfired a wee bit, um, I, I I I don't um, uh, I don't um, think that we should say that this is this is not something that is 
that people shouldn't attempt to be, to be, uh, to be humorous about. Humorous, but was it patronizing? Well, as I say, I think it misfired a wee bit in certain respects. Um, uh, but, I, but I also think that if... Look, if, if um, I mean, I think there's quite a serious point behind this, actually. There is a very serious no, point. There is a serious point behind this, and it's this, that, that every single person in Scotland is going to have a vote. Mm -hmm. And people consume information, and they get their information from all sorts of different channels. And, um, you know, brilliant though it is, I accept that not everybody is going to read this document. I mean, I think if you, um, I think um, if you sign it, it'll go for a lot of money. I will sign it, Kirsty, <laughs> and you can auction it later. Um, uh, uh, but I accept that not everyone is going to read this document. And next week, we will be, um, we've, we've produced a short leaflet from the Her Majesty's Government, um, which takes these arguments and, and, and boils them down. It's going to go through every single letterbox in Scotland in an effort to provide that information to people. And in a sense, what, what's been tr trying to be done is to, get get that, to draw people's attention to that information in lots of different ways. Um, I would rather that we, that we try to get that information across to people, even if sometimes, as you say, uh, the ways in which, which, um, uh, which it's done don't necessarily work for everybody. Gentleman right up at the back. Hello, Paul Murray. Um, I would like to ask a slightly different question, Mr. Alexander. Earlier, before you arrived, we had uh, a summary of all the various polls that have been uh, conducted, of which, as you know, there's many of them. But there was two, I think there were two clear themes, certainly from my point of view, it's come out from those polls. One was that even with the no voters, there's a, there's a clear view that the Yes campaign has had a pretty positive campaign so far compared to the No campaign. And the second one, as you know, is that there's a big block of undecided voters, yeah. a lot of whom will actually vote with their hearts rather than their heads. And with all due respect to your analysis of which I'm sure it's a, it's a fantastic document, my question for you is, how does the No campaign, with, with, with basically three months to go, how does the, the No campaign win the hearts and minds of the Scottish nation? Um, well, firstly, I don't accept this point about... Uh, sorry, I'm just leaving other questions. Oh, right, okay. I'm not being rude, sorry. No, um, I don't accept this positive-negative thing that is often positive. I've seen nothing more negative in this debate um, than the campaign of vilification aimed at J.K. Rowling and many others um, uh, by, by cybernats over, over, the, over the course of this campaign. Um, uh, and I think that it is really important. I mean, I, I, think, I think we're very fortunate in Scotland to be having this debate. It's a rare thing for a country to be able to have the chance to consider and debate its own future. I think that has to be a debate that every single person needs to feel able to participate in, to speak up in, to express their views, be they um, business leaders, accountants, or, or be they celebrities, or be they anybody in our community who wants to express their view. Because it really is a, it is really is a, a rare privilege that we have to, to do this. And, and I think that I find it really disappointing that there are many people who I've met, and I'm sure who everyone in this room has met, who feel that, um, that, that somehow uh, their right to speak is compromised because they fear being intimidated, being attacked for doing so. I think that we have a, should have a debate which takes on the arguments, which addresses the facts in the way that the questioning we just had about, about, um, about debt and, and borrowing uh, did very precisely. That's exactly how this debate should be. Uh, should be taking place. Um, uh, but I also think, and I, I tried to do this in, in, my, in my speech, though because I was addressing ICAS, I ad focused on the economic issues, which I hope was, I'm sorry if that was the wrong choice, um, uh, that we have to also convey this very simple point that we have the best of both worlds. That, you know, the UK is a family of nations with a great history, with a huge amount of strength, something that affects every aspect of our lives. Um, but, but we, but, and so it needs to be about both things, I think. My impression is that certainly I've been doing a lot of public meetings in my own constituency and elsewhere uh, over the past few, few months trying to precisely do what you're saying, which is get that message across directly to people. Most of the questions I get in those, in those meetings are about very practical things, about pensions, about jobs and employment and so on. But you get some other, exactly you say, some other sorts of questions. And I think we have to address that positively. We have to sell the positive case, what Scotland gains, how we're stronger as part of the United Kingdom. Um, but we mustn't allow um, the attacks from the nationalists who claim that we're being negative by somehow pointing out flaws in their argument, flaws in their case, um, from preventing us from doing so. Because it's actually also very important that people know that much of what they're being told um, uh, about what might happen under independence has no basis in, in evidence. 
question? Sorry, can I just ask one follow-up? Yeah. Sorry. I, mean, I, I think it's a very compelling case that you've made today in terms of the, uh, the no vote economically. I'm not, I'm not uh, disagreeing with that. What, what I'm saying is that I'm merely replaying what uh, seems to be quite a consistent message yeah. from the polls. So, I mean, can we expect a, a sort of different campaign from the no side over the next three months? I mean, do, do, do you just, just strategically and tactically, do you intend to do anything differently? Well, I think that as you get closer to polling day, um, I think we need to continue to make the arguments that we have been that we've been making. We need to take that message to every home and every community in Scotland. So I think that, I think there needs to be even more of a kind of grassroots feel to the campaign, so that people from any 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 walk of life can uh, can participate. You'll see you've seen that um, ten days ago um, uh, we uh, started to roll out this theme of no thanks, which is a a sort of polite refusal of, her, of the idea of, of, of independence, but also, and I think this is also very important, um, uh, setting out, you know, what are the things that Scotland can expect in terms of more powers for the Scottish Parliament, in terms of some of the economic benefits too, if we vote no. Because I think one of the things that's really important here is, in a sense, this isn't a choice between the status quo and independence. It's a choice between two different futures for Scotland. And I think we have to set out what that future looks like as well as some of the, the, the risks and dangers of, 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 of voting yes. You would accept that something like Eddie Izzard saying, please don't go, is a lot better than saying, no thanks. Uh, no, I would say that they're both excellent and important. And, um, <laughs> uh, and I think in these debates, you need a thousand flowers to bloom. Um, oh. uh, uh, because, as I say, I, I just think that, that we, I want a debate when everyone can speak up. Okay, well, Even you, Kirsty. You no, know, that'll never happen. So, <laughs> Um, question from Twitter. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> from Twitter. Um, why do you think that an independent government in Scotland would not be capable of running the economy? Um, I, I don't, I've never said that Scotland couldn't be independent. Uh, what, I've, what all my arguments are about is uh, that there are a lot of the decisions and judgments that would be harder because, um, because we don't have the, the shared strength and benefit economically in trading terms and financial terms and so on that we get from part of the United Kingdom. You know, I've been Chief Secretary to the Treasury for the last four years. I've been involved in taking some, you know, pretty difficult decisions that have been necessary in order to get our country back on the right track. And I think we are back on the right track now. Um, uh, and that applies to Scotland as much as to the, to the rest of the UK. But when I look at um, the sort of fiscal pressures that an independent Scotland would be under and compare that to what I've had to deal with, uh, over the past uh, uh, four years, uh, I think that that looks like a much harder task. Uh, another um, um, comment on Twitter. Dear God, Danny, stop lying. Just stop lying. The UK is in a fiscal fankel. <laughs> that might be a comment rather than a question. Um, <laughs> let me just... um, well, I'd say that the, the, uh, in 2010, the UK was in a fiscal fankel. It's quite a good expression. I might use that again myself, even if the, uh, the, that wasn't the, what the questioner was trying to do, was supply me with sound bites. Um, uh, but um, I, think we've, I think we've dealt with that. I think we've dealt, dealt with it very um, effectively. There's a lot more work to do to, to, to finish that particular job. Uh, my point is that um, the fiscal fankel, if you like, uh, would be um, a, 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 a far more complex knot to untie under independence than it is within the United Kingdom. Um, you wouldn't get away with fiscal fankel and Hansard because Donald Dewar used to try and put Scots words in Hansards to confuse them. I'll try it, Kirsty, and I'll report back to you. Um, here's another one um, from Fre Ferdinand Franchino. Um, British economy and poverty doubles in 30 years. What is the long-term plan? Well, it, it's, a, it's a really important uh, part of this uh, argument. And in the end, I think that the best route out of poverty is to get people into employment. Um, that's why so much of our efforts has been about how do we have an economy that is creating jobs for people, that is creating opportunities for people, particularly young people. Um, you know, youth unemployment in particular is a, is, a, uh, is a scar. And that's why, for example, in the coalition government, we have been working to double the number of apprenticeships that are available to, uh, to young people to support businesses to create jobs in lots of the ways that I'm not going to repeat that I, uh, that I talked about earlier. But it's also why... Um, the, the, it, this is one of the areas where, the, as, if you like, the gap between the rhetoric and the reality of uh, those who argue for independence is widest, because um, the, the resources available uh, to deal with those problems, as I explained when I was talking about the UK dividend, would be less. The finances would be more stretched. And so the idea that suddenly under independence there's going to be lots more money to spend on, uh, on welfare benefits and so on, which is part of the argument that some people make for it, 
it just is not borne out by reality, I don't think. Gentleman in the middle. Hello. Um, I would like to thank Danny Alexander for his party political broadcast, or should I say Daddy Alexander, if I may, may say so. Um, but I don't think we've sorted out just how, in the event of an independent uh, success, the national um, settlement would take place. I presume that it was asked. I think what she asked was the balance between national assets and national liabilities, presumably was, was what would accrue to Scotland. But personally, another aspect that wasn't fully mentioned about what you might call the heart aspect. I, I think there's a great value. In fact, I hope that what you might call the cultural or heart aspect it does play a bigger important part, a more important part in the, the next three months. So there. Um, so there. So there. So there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, I think, thank you. Well, thank you for the comments. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you thought it was a part of the little broadcast. I hadn't intend, intended it in that way. But anyway, um, on the assets and, and, and liabilities, when we talked about the, the debt, of course, um, because the, the debt figures are net debt, they include financial assets as well as, as, as liabilities, so it's accumulated within, uh, within those uh, numbers. Um, uh, obviously, divvying up of assets and liabilities is something that would be part of any negotiations that would follow uh, uh, the, the referendum, but no one has suggested that the way in which assets and liabilities are divided up would be something that actually would be um, uh, to the financial advantage or disadvantage of either Scotland or the rest of the United Kingdom. I think it's a technical exercise that has to be uh, gone through. In many cases, the, the facts speak for themselves. Where something is located is clearly rather an important question, for example. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's a particularly sort of, sort of a, a big issue, and I'm sure you're right that the heart will play as much of a as much of a role as the head in, in, in the final decisions. And in a sense, what I was trying to say earlier was that I think one of my jobs, and one of the, particularly one of the government's jobs, is to make sure that um, if people are looking for information, if they want information, if they want to understand the facts behind it, that they're able to get hold of it, um, uh, and that information is available. It is because of our programme. How people choose to make up their minds is, of course, a matter for them. Well, what's extraordinary? I mean, all, all the arguments come forward and all the economic data and so forth. But when we can't seem to agree on a one and a half minute remark from Mark Carney. I mean, the interpretations of that have been so different, haven't they? Which about what whether, I'm talking about sterilization. I'm talking about uh, how we actually would ever operate if there was independence. You know, would we be allowed to keep the pound? It seems that you're saying that Mark Carney came down very clearly, this would not be an option. And yet other people in the room have said today that Mark Carney's inter the interpretation was that Mark Carney would make it work. Well, I didn't say that Mark Carney took a view politically on whether a currency union should happen or not. He gave a very detailed speech in which he explained um, uh, the, 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 the strictures that are necessary to make a currency union work, and he also made clear that in the end that is a matter of that, that, you know, the actual, you know, he, he would, he would you know, do whatever uh, he was instructed to do. Yeah, but um, in the event, No, 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 can yeah. I finish? It's, a, it's, a, it's an, it's an it important is. point, this. Um, uh, the... The issue about the, 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 the currency union, and the point I was referring to in my speech, was Mark Carney was very clear that in order to have a currency union, you need to have behind it a currency union that works. Uh -huh. You need to have behind it a political union, a fiscal union, um, and it's precisely those things that, that, that the whole idea of independence is about dissolving. Let's be, let's be quite clear. Just say there is a yes vote. And then let's say that the incoming government goes for currency union and you are, by, not by some miracle, still in power, but I mean you are still part of a, a new coalition perhaps that's in power at Westminster. Are you saying that you, Dalia, Danny Alexander, though it would, be, would actively campaign to stop Scotland being in a currency union? Well, I think there's a range of implausible assumptions there, which I'm so I'm not going to get into the um, uh, into the hypotheticals of it. What I'd say is, um, look, if we vote to be independent, then um, I won't be, um, you know, I won't be part of a future government of the United Kingdom because I'll be, you know, my well, my, be, uh, a, my constituency in the UK Scottish representation in the UK but Parliament be a, be will have this been period. will be have been this, abolished. But there'll be um, this interregnum. As let well me explain saying. something that hopefully answers your question. As a Scot, I think the idea that you enter into this enormously risky and uncertain journey of setting up a new state without the power to set your own interest rates, 
without an exchange rate that can fluctuate in a, in a, in a highly natural resource dependent economy, uh, having bound your hands on tax and spending, which you'd have to do for the, all the fiscal reasons that I, was, uh, that I was talking about, is simply the wrong choice for Scotland. This isn't about the rest of the... It's the wrong choice for Scotland. It's a bit like saying uh, Alex Salmond wants us all to buy a new car, but unfortunately he's removed the steering wheel. It just simply wouldn't but, work. But there will be, you accept, there is a period in which these negotiations will take place where you'll still be an MP if you are elected again and if you're returned to government. We just want to get this question. I just want to... Well, that's lots of ifs, Kirsty. Yes. Um, Here's the next if. Oh, good. As you just said rightly, of course, if there's a yes vote in the Scottish referendum, and as there is an independent country, would you, in some future role, ever play a political part in that country? I don't know what the answer to that question is because you're a young because, man with uh, kids and a mortgage. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't refute any of those facts. <laughs> Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't seek to. Look, that's a, that's a long way off. I haven't, I haven't really spent... You don't time. rule out. There's a favourite journalist question. You no, don't rule out. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't um, made any decisions on that because I, want, I fundamentally and passionately believe that we are stronger as part of the United Kingdom and I'm going to spend all of my time, effort, energy and imagination trying to persuade people to vote no rather than uh, 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 sitting at home pondering uh, what might be at some, uh, under some um, Kirsty Walk series of hypotheticals. <laughs> Last question. Danny, forgive the, uh, the, I guess, the personal inference of this question for, for you, but uh, let's fast forward and assume uh, in September you achieve a, a no vote. Uh, fast forward again to the next general election and uh, the result is a Conservative UKIP coalition. Um, con conceivably with no MPs in Scotland for either of those parties, is that government best place to determine the future of Scotland and, and advocate Scottish people's best interests? Well, I think the best government for the whole of the United Kingdom, including Scotland, would be a Liberal Democrat government. Um, uh, however, um, uh, uh, I'd, I'd be bound to accept that in the short term, a Liberal Democrat majority seems like one of the less likely outcomes of the next uh, general election. Um, uh, but uh, look, I happen to think that, um, that actually coalition government works pretty well. Um, I think that... Uh, 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 that from the, f for the whole of the UK, actually either a majority Labour government or a majority Conservative government on their own would not be the right choice for the, for the country, that there is a national interest in having a government that is, that is rooted in the, uh, in the, in the, in the centre ground. Um, I doubt very much that UKIP will, will um, be troubling the scorers in, term, in part, terms of parliamentary representation at the next election. Um, but there's something that they want to achieve, which I fundamentally disagree with, which is taking Britain out of the European Union. I think that would be a disaster for all of us. Mm. Um, I think there are, there are huge benefits to Scotland and to the whole of the United Kingdom from being part of the European Union, as it happens, for precisely the same sort of reasons as, I think, apply to the economic case for Scotland in the United Kingdom. Exactly those same arguments uh, apply to the case of Britain being part of the European Union, and I hope with exactly the same result, which is that we remain a country, as Scots, which is in Britain and in Europe. That's the outcome that I want to see. Um, I think that nationalism as a philosophy is about putting up barriers. As a liberal, I believe in breaking down barriers between countries and peoples wherever we find them. And uh, uh, I hope that we can play a role in, in that both in Scotland and across the whole of the United Kingdom. Here's another hypothetical just to finish with then. Um, there is a no vote and by some, not miracle, but by some, um, you know, sophology, you are back in power in a coalition with the Conservatives who are committed to a referendum on Europe. And despite your best efforts, that referendum goes ahead. And despite that, your best efforts, uh, the United Kingdom, including Scotland, but maybe not the people the of Christ, Scotland. I find this quite no, strange. I mean, there's, Vote there's, to there's, come out of the European Union, then what do you do? It's, I, I'm oh. delighted that all of my arguments for Scotland saying the UK have been accepted and that the, the questioning has turned to a series of um, <laughs> random hypotheticals uh, far into the future. I'm delighted that you accept the, uh, the, that the Scotland is financially and economically stronger as part of the United Kingdom uh, and that we've established that during this session. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, I really do not want to see uh, either Britain or Scotland leave the European Union to, to, to give a serious answer to, to, that, um, to that question. I don't believe that we will, because I think that the, uh, the, the, the fundamental economic interests on both points will uh, prevail. Well, this was not hypothetically Danny Alexander. This was Danny Alexander. Thank you very much for being so candid. <laughs> Thank you. Anton.